allowed in here, right? I just went out in the hallway. If you need a break, I won't be offended. Do you do you want to do you want to go back out there? If, if, no, I'm just yeah. saying that if you need like a oh, vacation, if, somebody else leaves. if anybody needs a vacation, just right in the hallway. So it's as hot out there as it is under these the showbiz lights. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. What, when you're when you're on stage and you are, uh, I just watched the La Tigra documentary, and it to me that looked like the most fun thing that anybody could possibly have a chance to do, which would be to to play great music and, and dance for a continual hour and a half. But <laughs> what, what's the heat like in that situation? You know, it's pretty hot, especially because a lot of our outfits were polyester, which we didn't think about yeah. beforehand. <laughs> Later we did, I remember Joe had this, uh, my bandmate had this zip up polyester jacket she wore every night and it was just like pit. Uh. <laughs> so they didn't have, like now, they have those materials that, that are, are great for any kind of weather. Like you know? Uniqlo? Yeah. 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 Too late for that. Just that. How about a reunion tour just just for the, the, the weather resistant Sponsored outfits. by yeah. Uniqlo. Yeah. So I have, a, I, have a, I, have a, I have a serious question that I'd like to start with, and I need to quote my little arts and crafts card. God, I'm totally scared. No, 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 no. It's not scary at all. Uh, you you wrote in an in, you wrote an introduction or a foreword or I don't know what the difference is to uh, to the Karen Finley book the reality shows a couple years ago and you wrote and you were talking about how when you discovered her you were about 19 years old and you wrote finally I had found a feminist writer who didn't have to chop herself into bits to be comprehended and and I I love that sentence but it also struck me as something that could be said about about your work so. Kind of what, what did exactly, take me more into what you meant by that and, and how when you saw her at 19 and you started thinking those things, you said, this is how I can progress in my, my work. Wow. That's a good fucking question. <laughs> it's so fucking long. Yeah. Um, it's really funny. Here's the question shorter. <laughs> you wrote an introduction to Karen Finley's book. How did I'm just going to talk about what I want to talk about. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Ignore that question. I'm um, going gonna to put these over here. Just put those over there. Yeah. Um, I actually I met one of my favorite writers, Kathy Acker, the yeah. week before I saw Karen Finley perform. And um, I was in a workshop with her, a writer's workshop, and she told me that I shouldn't do spoken word because it sucked. And um, nobody... Because your spoken I'm sorry word? if anybody does spoken word. Okay, so the genre in general, not Yeah, she was just word. like, it sucks. Nobody wants to watch that. And um, <laughs> she told me that I should start a band. And she asked me to open for her. And it's funny talking about criticism because I got my first bad review opening for Kathy Acker. And the guy who gave me the bad review was in the workshop and didn't get chosen. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is what the world is like. Sorry, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Emily um, wasn't going to be cast in the newsroom. I mean, it's totally. <laughs> Although you'd be a great, a great character on Scandal, a new member of the team. Um, <laughs> But I, it's really funny because I actually, it was at this place called Co Coca or Coco or something in Seattle. And um, I went back. I didn't know who the fuck Karen Finley was, but I went back the next week after I read with Kathy Acker just to try to get recognized. Like I went to the same club a week later. Like I, I got on the bus from Olympia and went an hour away hoping that I'd be sitting in the audience and somebody would be like, you were that girl who opened for Kathy Acker last week. Like, I thought I was a really big celebrity. Um, and then she blew my fucking mind. Like, she was just like, she started the show by saying, no photography, this shit only happens once. Which is, I mean, that you couldn't even say that now without people saying, don't be ridiculous. Like, everything is yeah. photographed, everything is videotaped. Well, it was the 90s also. It yeah. was like this whole thing of like, don't take my picture and like thinking about the male gaze and this kind of, not very complicated way, I think. And, um, <laughs> but yeah, she you know, put chocolate on herself and talked about incest and rape and made jokes about it. And I, I don't know, I just felt like I want to do that. I want to be, a, and more than being in a band, like I always kind of considered myself, until kind of now maybe, I always thought what I was doing was feminist performance art. Like when I was in a band, I always thought I was like playing this role of like a feminist in a band. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So when, so why did that change? You said until now. I got really into music. Like I got really into making music and um, thinking about song structure and some kind of formal ideas about music and what? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't know. I just decided I kind of wanted to be a musician for a while and that I wanted to step back from that role of, um, you know, 
writing the song that hadn't been written or considering myself a character. Like, I kind of just want to be me on stage for once. Did you ever feel like people were saying, okay, this next Kathleen Hanna record has to say these things, has to do these things? Was it a question of that, or was it more of an internal thing? I think it was both, but, I mean, I put, everybody puts a lot of pressure on themselves, like, more than anybody else, any outside person does, and I really did start my career as a musician thinking about what was missing. You know, and it was, there was so much missing that it was really easy to write songs. I was like, wow, this is like a great shtick. No one else is, I mean, other people, there were other women in bands and stuff, other feminists in bands, but it wasn't as like didactic as I was laying it out in Bikini Kill and my lyrics. And I felt like that was something missing that I wanted to see. And um, when I look back, I realize that a lot of times I've written stuff for my younger self and then caught up, or sometimes caught up to it, like written stuff that I didn't know why I was writing it, and then I realized that I was telling myself this advice that I needed to take. So you said in that, in that forward to the Karen Finley book, you said something you as You really like that book. <laughs> you like, can't I, I, get over that well, book. Well, I mean, I can, I can ask about forwards to other books you've written. You wrote the <laughs> forward to the Great Gatsby, and you wrote about... <laughs> but, you wrote, but you said in, in 1989, that was when you kind of first came to understand kind of the male violence that had been perpetuated against you. How did you then turn that in to kind of, I guess, the confidence or the awareness to start writing things about it? You know, a lot of people could feel that or, or, or could say, this is, this is really wreaked havoc on my life, but then it doesn't turn into something. You know, can you say that again? I'm like totally spaced out on that green light right now. I'm just like, I'm not stoned. Well, I'm not stoned. I'm just like, that green light's like really. Do you think it's green? That one right there, isn't it? Well, it's got red and it's, got, a, it's got three blues in it as well. You guys Four can't blues. see it. It's like. It's red, green, and a little bit of blue. Okay, how did I decide that I actually wanted to do something, yeah, like yeah. to take action? Um, I was at the bus stop and my roommate had been assaulted and the cops treated us like shit about it and the guy tried to kill her and beat her up and then I was on my way to school and I was doing photography classes and stuff and I was like just thought to myself what do you really want to do with your life it was just this I mean I have so many epiphany moments I could just make up so much <laughs> I could tell you so many epiphany moments but this was like a big bus stop epiphany and um, I was just like I want to end violence against women and it wasn't just about my experience. It was like, you know, I saw my friends who were away from their, like, abusive dads or uncles or whatever or brothers who finally at college were able to, like, remember stuff because they weren't in that situation. And they were just dropping out of school like flies because they couldn't maintain their courses. And when something like that is just at arm's length, like everywhere around you, and you feel like everybody's, nobody's talking about it, you know, and it happened to my roommate, and I was just standing there, and I was like, that's what I wanted. And luckily, there was a business office for the Rape Relief Domestic Violence Shelter called Safe Place, literally a block and a half away. And so I was like, I'm just going to walk over there. And I walked over there, and that is really what changed my life and set me on a path to, like, doing something. Like, the reason I first got on stage was to advertise a teenage sexual assault group because I thought it looked, like, cooler to be a feminist <laughs> Sure, well, the, instead <laughs> Than to be, yeah, you know, like, you. the lady who so was, like, come out. join my sexual assault support group. Sure. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I was there was that – horrible story out of Cleveland last week, I guess, which ended, I guess if you can have a happy ending to it, it ended well and that the people, the, the women were released. But it strikes me when that kind of thing happens, that is almost the only time that we read about violence against women and then it kind of gets mixed up in the sensational kind of media flow. So how do you get the point across that this is happening every day quietly and that people are, women are dropping out of school because it hurts them so much, but it's not getting on, on the network news. I think by doing it in a different way, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, like when I first started, when we first started playing music, um, it was like, there are two women in the audience typically. 
And so to actually be singing to those two women felt really special. It didn't feel like what it feels like now on like Channel 23, the you know, Violence Against Women channel. Um, what like crime TV or whatever, where it's just like murder, 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 murder. And I always find myself watching those shows like to see who gets away and what they do to get away. And then I'm like, ooh, I'm a part of this gross thing of like watching violence against women being like titil titillating. Exploding it on TV. Exploding yeah, but I'm just wait. I wish that I could like somebody would edit it to the part where like the roommate jumps over the patio and gets help and saves her best friend. Like I just want to like fast forward to that part and then if somebody could just make me like a DVD <laughs> of all of that where like the women get away or they save themselves or I don't, I don't know how to get stuff about violence against women I mean it's not all I think about no I understand that <laughs> it's like uh, you, you wrote in the intro to the Karen I'm just joking just joking oh just, uh, it's a joke it's a joke it's a joke <laughs> I heard that you you think you think a lot about uh, home design Yes, I actually took interior design classes at Parson. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. Mm -hmm. what, it, what, it, what is the philosophy there? Should you have everything in your room or your house? Should you say, I'm going modernist? <laughs> or should you mix up the modernist with the Victorian, with the <laughs> other thing that I'd, I'd only know modernist and Victorian? <laughs> like, what's the secret? I think a Santa Fe style would be really good for, for me. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah, like sort of like, like a cact, like a lot of cacti in the house. Yeah, just like you know, some like kind of sunsetty colors, like some desert. You see that? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I see in your eyes. <laughs> Santa Fe style. I, I mean, I think I really did the interior design thing. I'm actually one class away because I dropped out. From my AAS, my associate degree, I, I have to take construction documents, and I was like so terrified by it. What does that mean? It's like you have to learn how to read, and I already can draft and stuff, but it's like you have to like learn how to read and um, discuss construction drawings, and it's like the most boring thing that I can possibly think of, um, besides maybe Cheers. I hated that show. I hated that show. That was why, like the why? worst thing. Why? Speaking of Night Did you Court. Like, you like Night Court? Well, of course. I mean, Marky Post's like feathered hair. Yeah, yeah. You ha are, we can't be the same age. You must be younger than me because you're talking about all this shit that like, I, t I totally know. What, like, what about what, MASH? I mean, I, mean, what, I, yeah, I, liked, I liked MASH. <laughs> MASH was good. <laughs> what about uh, Small Wonder? Oh, my God. That was my total jam. I used to say that, that it was a documentary about me. <laughs> I was like, my parents just like put me in a closet. But how crazy. Does anybody know that show? She's a small wonder everybody. bringing love. See, that's the problem. There's no small wonder of today, right? Because everybody watches the, the good shows. And you can't, you, I, we would not, 30 years from now, there's, there's the new versions of us on stage. And the new version is reading a foreword <laughs> and quoting from a foreword. And then tries to bring up a bad show or a show that inspired you. That... Uh, we, w we wouldn't be able to do that because we'd be like, I didn't see that show. That was on channel 823. Yeah, no, no, no. And I'd say, oh, I only watched the first 300 channels. <laughs> yeah. No, I miss that thing where, like, we all watched Wizard of Oz in our pajamas on the same night and you knew. Like, the only thing like that is, like, the Knicks playing tonight in the, to yeah. get into the championship or, like, like sports things where everybody's watching, like, um, what do you call that football thing? Football? No, that big football thing. Super Bowl. Uh, super, yeah. <laughs> Um, Are you a sports fan? <laughs> I but used to really softball, like right? I, I I I do play softball and I used to really like ice skating a lot. What happened to you or to ice skating? Well, once Asana Bayul stopped skating and Michelle Kwan, I was like out out of there. You know, yeah. you know she did a. But aren't there new one, aren't there new ones that do great things? I'm sure too? they are, but I was just like Figure it was eights. like this phase where I was just like those two. But interior design. Yeah. Um, I think it really had to do with playing in too many disgusting clubs that smell like beer, where people play bocce on themselves. No, I'm just kidding. There but there um, just like so many gross bathrooms and so many like clubs that, you know, when you walk into a club as a band, I'm sure there's lots of musicians in the room. It's like, and the lights are on and you see how totally fucking disgusting it is. And then they turn the lights down low and it's like you're in a cool rock venue. But like we know it's like so gross. Sure. It smells so bad and the bathroom that you use has like, 
you know, huge dicks like drawn all over it and yeah. stuff. And I was just like, I want. I did interior design as like an escape from that. Like I was like, I'm gonna it's design a, a beautiful aesthetic. rock club that is not <laughs> dirty or whatever. And it was totally different. And I really wanted to know I could do something besides music. Like I could get a real job in the world. And I wanted to know that like I could do something and nobody knew who I was and I would j just get treated. I'm not like I'm like. Demi Moore and people were like, oh, there's Demi Moore. Like, but that you'd have to move to Idaho, a little small right. town. No, but it's like it's not like I get recognized on the street or anything. But it's like I wanted to know that I could do something out of my comfort, comfort zone. zone. Yeah, yeah, that's what you said. I hate that. Do you know? Out of the do box. you know that uh, uh, the one of the people in Wilco, Pat Sansonic, Pat Sansone, he he has no uh, sense of smell, for real. So that that. Might he can be, play clubs forever. He, he's fine with it. He yeah. doesn't have that issue and hasn't gone into. Um, so, so <laughs> what an interview stopper. <laughs> so what's going on? So why, why the documentary now? Why did you say, I want to talk about all this shit? Oh, God, it's so heavy. All right. What, so, so softball. You play softball? <laughs> what position? I what position? A, I love second base, but. Do you use gloves out here in Chicago? They don't use gloves. We're just like hardcore. Um, actually, our team plays VH1 every year. Like the What's VH1 has a team. Isn't that weird? And we cream them every single time. But they're all like these big buff dudes who've been practicing. Team? Our team is called Team Pressure, and our slogan is um, Chuck. What is it? Um, oh, no pressure. We need this. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> what does VH1 do anymore besides play softball? I don't know. Do they do like Teen Mom or something like that, or like Basketball Wives? They used to show they used to show videos from late period Springsteen, but I don't know what they do now. No. So second base. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let's. I want to talk about the documentary. Is that not that's no that's no? Cool. no I mean, it's, right. it's a film. I mean, it's going it was, around. It, it's it was like shot in 2010. I was in a really different headspace. Um, I have uh, I had really bad Lyme disease. I don't know if anybody else in here has really bad Lyme disease, yeah. but um, is that over? Is that well? It's never over. Right, right. Um, you know, I'm. Look at me. Look how great I look. I'm fantastic. I'm doing great. Um, I'm out here. I'm drinking Diet Coke. I'm talking. And that wasn't the case in 2009. No, it, between 2000 when I quit Lake Tigra in 2004 and 2008, I was really sick, and that's why I quit. And um, I was like, didn't know what it was, and kept going to all these different doctors, and um, it was really awful. I thought I was dying, and basically, uh, that's why I did the documentary, and that's why um, I archived my work at Fails because I thought, you know, this is really sad. <laughs> but you know, if you think that you have this illness and you don't know what it is, and you don't know if you're going to end up like in a in a wheelchair, unable to talk you start really thinking about, I don't want my friends to have to deal with my shit. Yeah. Like, I need to figure out where this stuff is going to go. And um, also, I'm just one of those freaks who, like, really wants to be remembered. I want to be legendary. I want... <laughs> I, mean, I, don't <laughs> no, I do. I, I want attention. I want, you know, and feminist work is so often erased. And it's like... One generation later, I could just, it could be like, Lee Tigre never existed, Bikini Kill never existed. It's like, we have to work to um, ensure that it, it stays around and that people remember it and build on it and critique it and make new things that say, you know, your songs suck, my songs are better. Because that's the whole point is that so, it's a continuum, it's not. I mean, I don't know whether this is true or whether I'm just spouting cliche about feminism, but people have said, people have written that that it is one of those things where there's a cycle, where there's 10 years on, and then for some reason people say, oh, we're fine, we're fine, we, can, we don't need to do anything. <laughs> and then 10 years later, after that, people wake up and say, what the fuck were we thinking? Is that, is that true, and how, does the, how, how, do you, how do you stop that cycle? Well, um, there's this really great line in Shalameth Firestone's um, groundbreaking work, The Dialectics of Sex, where she talked about 50 years of ridicule, and, uh, it was basically her point was that there was fi it was 50 years in between cycles because people just laughed at it and made fun of it. Um, <clears throat> I I tend to think that it's 20 years 
because I feel like it takes 20 years for a lot of us to get over the damage of community building. Um, <laughs> and that's when we can kind of look back and be like, here's where we fucked up, here's where we did well. And that's when we start writing our books, or in my case, having a documentary uh, made about me, hopefully that is honest. Um, I think it takes 20 years for people to be honest, and then that re-inspires a new generation. You go to, to schools and you, and you talk, mm -hmm. and I've also, I, I had a, a woman, Tavi, from, from yeah, Rookie, yeah, yeah. and she was on the show. And, and I know sh that you are kind of a, you know, a hero of hers. And she, she also, I asked, her, I asked her a question. I said, what? She talked about how she was very interested in history. And I said, well, OK, what, what decades in history? And she said, the 90s. And I said, that's fucking <laughs> I know, history. I know, I know. And it's I was so, so depressed by it's it. It's so scary. But so I guess my, my, my two-part <laughs> question is, what, what, what were the 90s? Were they, they're not, they're over, right? They're, <laughs> And then what do you talk about when you go to colleges? Um, I recite the vagina monologues <laughs> backwards <laughs> in like kind of an exorcist voice. <laughs> um, no. Um, wait, what was the first question? What were the, what Tavi, was, oh, the 90s? Describe the 90s. The 90s. It's like I don't want to insult the 90s. They were good. Made me do it. I don't know. I mean, I, don't I, know I, how I didn't they do were. much during them, but I, I felt like. Other people were doing things. I'm just upset about stretch pants, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. It's like, it was a bad, I mean, these are tight. But I'm just saying, like, you did, see, you everyone did, in here is probably wearing black stretch pants. But it's like. You didn't have to deal with uh, Zumbas, though. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> we got that song, hey, 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 hey. I did an aerobics class one time, and they used, you know that song, that Pornod Blonde song? that you, now everybody cannot get out of their head and they're gonna like go home and be like, fuck her, why did she sing that? Yeah. Um, but man, I'm hyped on Diet Coke. I really, I'm really hyped. You've only had half a glass. I know. I saw Linda Perry getting out of a cab and she still had the hat on and this was like <laughs> six, months, six months ago. And I really like Linda Perry. Um, but so I, I worry about me in the 90s because I'm so heavily associated by the 90s, so I'm like, do I look, do you look 90s? 90s today? Like, am I wearing? Well, what would that be? What would looking 90s be? Are I don't you fucking know. I mean, I wore sweater? like a leotard with like fake blood on it yeah. for half of the 90s. So like, but most people didn't wear that in the 90s, so it wouldn't be like. Well, you know, like you know, little plaid skirts and stuff like that. I'm 44. Like, what yeah. am I gonna do in a little plaid? Well, I, could, I could do that at home, I guess. Yeah. In my private in my private time. Do you still own them? But what? Do you still own the clothes? No, they're all at um, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that that got a laugh because we, <laughs> they actually have a traveling exhibit about women in music and they asked um, members of Bikini Kill for stuff and I gave them my plaid lunchbox and a lot of people don't remember the lunchbox from the 90s. It was really big and I was like, I need to make sure the lunchbox is represented yeah. in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I gave them like my lunchbox and like, what did we give them? Um, I don't remember, I gave them some, maybe one outfit or something, but it's a traveling exhibit. And I was like, does it travel in a trash can? <laughs> like, cause I just feel like, I don't know. I went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and it was embarrassing. Embarrassing. This is going to be on the internet. It's, <laughs> like, nobody's going to see it. It's, it's nobody's like, going to see it. Nobody's going to see it. What was embarrassing? The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was no, embarrassing? No, no, no. I just, like, I had this fantasy um, about going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and then sitting outside with, like, Bonnie Raitt, like, smoking a joint in a van that said the Women's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and yeah. it was just like the two of us waiting for women to walk through the parking lot, and then being like, come in here, this is the real Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Like, and, and, and the reality was? Bunny Rate will not return my email. <laughs> <laughs> she's around still though, right? I mean, it's not that yeah. she, yeah, she's yeah, not Yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah. Maybe Alana Miles will. <laughs> Taylor Dane. <laughs> now we're talking the 90s. Now we're defining them. What, uh, so, so the new, you've got a new record that, that is in yeah. 
progress? What's what's this? Is it coming out? It's what's in the can, as you the, mentioned with the, the what, Chris what, Mills. What, also has it in the can. What do you say? What you don't say in the can? You say in the. That's uh, kind of embarrassing that you said that. Actually. It was it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm totally just kidding. Um, I love that forward. You in wrote. the can. I, th I was so happy when I found that <laughs> forward. I was like, this is a great forward. Probably a lot of people. She won't expect I'm going to ask about it. You should have read my uh, Lisa Suckdog forward for her ebook. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do, how much time do we have? Do we uh. download it right now? <laughs> well, maybe in your alone You time. pursue your heroes. You, you, you contact your heroes. You try to get in touch with them. I like that. She wasn't my hero well, all right, I don't know at all. Her, we were nemesis. nemesis. I think it's nemesis. I think it's nemesi, like cacti. We were nemesis. Nemesis. In the 90s. Nemesizer. Size. Yeah. And, uh, and then we re-met. Actually, at a spoken word event. There you go. And um, she was fucking fantastic. And I went up to her and shook her hand and introduced myself. Times change. And the one thing about Lisa Suckdog that I will say is she was a totally worthy nemesis. And everybody should have a worthy nemesis, not a petty nemesis that isn't like talented at their own particular fuck up no. shit that they do that pisses you off. Like, I think they should be Do you think you need a nemesis in general? I don't need one to function anymore, but I think in the 90s I really did need, like, a wall to bang my head against, and without it... I always need, like... Oh God, I don't want to say anything about a box because I hate outside the box, outside the comfort zone. But I like working in a box with limitations. Like, I like it when I can only do the poster in black and white sure. for money purposes because then it's so much easier than if you have everything at your disposal. Um, but yeah, the new album's coming out. <laughs> the new album is done, and it's awesome. It's in awesome. the can. And it's really exciting. It's really funny because we started, I'm totally dominating this whole thing and not letting you talk. What, what, that's what it's supposed to happen. Okay. <laughs> um, when does the album come out? <laughs> in early fall. What does it sound like? It sounds <laughs> awesome. And it's like, Are you going to go on like, tour? Uh, yes. Are you coming to Chicago? Yes. Um, I don't remember what I was going to say. Oh, it was really funny because it started the same way that Lee Tigger started, which was that I wanted, me and Johanna, my bandmate, um, wanted to learn the J Julie Ruin songs, which is a solo record that I did in 1998, or 1998. Um, and we wanted to learn how to actually play them and then go on tour and do them, and we couldn't figure it out. So we just started writing new songs, and then that became Le Tigre. And so after I started getting better um, from my Lyme disease and stuff, and I was like, you know, laying in bed sick, thinking, you know, who would be my dream band? Yeah. And um, I asked all of the people I wanted my dream band to be in my dream band, and they all joined up. And we did the same thing, except for we actually learned the, almost the entire Julie Ruin first record, and then we wrote a whole new one. So mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Happy to have you.